John Hopkins is a filmmaker from Prince Edward Island, Canada's smallest province, and he's the creator of Bluefin, a film about the bluefin tuna which travel north every summer from their breeding grounds in the Caribbean to feed on vast schools of mackerel, capelin, and herring off PEI. Recently, though, those species have been diminishing, and the tuna, which are normally shy and wary, seem to have lost their fear of fishermen and appear to be starving. Focusing on these tuna, Bluefin asks why our social and political relationships as humans have made us incapable of living in sustainable harmony with ocean wildlife, and what we can do about that. Canada has a great tradition of documentary filmmaking, especially for the National Film Board, which is uh, how I made this film. And um, because of that, I was able to uh, spend more time with my subject in terms of the, the bluefin tuna fishing and ocean issues off of Prince Edward Island, wildlife issues and what's going on with the fishery. And as a result, I finished my film and I've been out on the festival circuit with it. I guess one of the things that puzzled me about the situation, we had a, we had a basically you had fished out the tuna in, in, uh, in Prince Edward Island, what, 12, 14 years ago. 10 year pause, no tuna, and then they come back, and they come back, and big fish, and in large numbers, come back for the herring. But if the herring is gone now, are the tuna gone too? Or yeah, are they there's, no, to there's not a food source, the, the, they're gone, yeah. Basically, they'll disappear. And that's what, basically this year was much harder to catch tuna over there because they scattered, because the herring boats aren't catching anything. So the tuna were coming around the herring boats because when you're pulling up the herring net, you know, like there'd be like small herring like fall off of it. Do you know what I mean? So that's why they're sort of enclosed and it actually helped the charter uh, fishing, the sports fishing was easy because you, you basically hang out near the herring boats, which was the food source, and you'd, you know, hook a tuna um, and then try to keep them from like uh, getting tangled up in the nets, you know, type of thing. So yeah, made for pretty much, um, uh, you know, you go out and you could hook up in a tuna for like in, in, in two minutes. And the, the fish became um, so desperate in terms of uh, the hunger. Um, you know, you could hand feed the fish right over the side of the boat. And tuna have always been a very wary fish. They've always been very uh, scared of humans. Like you'd be fishing in the old days when the stocks are great, you'd be fishing for 30 days and not even see a tuna. You know, or, and people would come and, and charter a boat for 30 days. These days, if you don't catch like, you know, three to five tuna in a week, then th people don't want to come back. You know, it's, you're obviously not a good captain, you know. Uh, but basically, you, you, you know, you can, uh, it's at the point now where the tuna, you know, they're not a stupid animal. They're a smart animal. And they realize that the boats are actually a food source. Somebody was telling me that the, the fish are now out here are so tame now that they're actually throwing some heron right from the boat and the fish are coming right up and getting them. They, they were always the opposite to, uh, as far as I was concerned, oh, they are yeah. always shy and oh, yes, they couldn't... Extremely. They're hungry. They want to be fed. We hand feed them from a herring. When we shook the herring nets out, they're coming for food. It's like any stray dog comes to your door and he comes looking, you give him that first bite. Who's gonna, what's going to be there the next morning? He's going to be back again soon. He heard the doorknob and you open, look, step out, and he's ain't going to be too far away. He's going to look for another biscuit or a slice of bread or something, and that tuna's looking for easy meals. That's what they want. Another thing that's happening is, is that, so our stock assessment model is busted because they're so easy to catch. The fish are hungry. I mean, DFO is in complete denial. I was on the current about that, and all you know, the fish are fat and fine. It's just complete nonsense. It's, it's not. It's, even the fish, fishermen will tell you that's not true. Um, uh, but he, he, but so, and then you have uncertainty in terms of the 59% of the tuna being here from the European that's, uh, European origin. So that's not even been studied. You know. So basically, what we need is a new stock assessment model because the old one doesn't work because of the changes. Uh, a way that we're fishing. DFO is saying no, it's the fishermen have changed their behavior, meaning like we're just better fishermen and we're just catching more fish. Well, th it's true in terms of the technology, but it's also because we're starving to death because they're taking all the food away for lobster bait, which is really, really where we're making our money, right? So what's happened is, is that, uh, you know, with the conservative government cutting back on science, there's been a big attack on science by a lot of like, you know, the 1% that are controlling government, which is like a huge problem. 
Um, and science is a real threat, you know, because it, it's, it, if, if somebody wants to do, like, exploit something, then you have to go through an environmental process. So that all these people are attacking science and attacking environmental regulations and, you know, stuff like that. So um, what DFO has done is just sort of like, well, we need to find a new way. So they, what they did was they came up with uh, a, uh, a new way of doing a stock assessment through uh, acoustic sonar. And, and I was out in the boat with one of their scientists, and, you know, what basically what you do is you tack back and forth, north and south, against the, um, the east-west longitude of the island. And through, all, you know, through a number, basically it sends down a beam in any tuna that swims through it. It's recorded on a computer which is inside the, the, the cabin. So they can actually do kind of a, a general assessment in terms of how much of uh, the fish are in that particular area. And you can add it all up, whatever. Um, I mean, but it's going to take 10 years to perfect that. But meanwhile, basically, we have no indices. The in there's no indices in terms of any kind of proper stock assessment available anymore, which is a really big question. And, it, and to go to ICAT and keep on saying, no, we got this many fish, um, uh, give us this much quota, I mean, it, it, it's in complete chaos, basically. Um, so, and the DFO knows that, you know, and basically ICAT, some of the signs are saying, well, you actually your, your, your stats are off or on to you. Don't use supercharged data to come back and try to get more quota from us because we know what's going on. Anyway, so the solution is, you know, the solution they came up with, and it's absolutely insane. They went and got more quota in addition to what they get from ICAT from Mexico. And I'm going like, I was going like, how does Mexico figure into this? You know, it's like the unemployment insurance. There's like a lot of weird stuff that happens. Like, okay, Mexico. Well, how's Mexico? Anyway, basically at the end of the season, which would be September 30th, um, you know, you either caught all your tags, and then after that there's a few left over, some you didn't catch, and then they put it back into, uh, into a, you know, the Fishermen's Association. There's a barrel with your name on it, your number, and you pull out, well, you get to catch an extra fish this year. Well, a lot of those tags that were in that barrel was what they call the Mexican quota. So basically what's happened is in Mexico you cannot uh, catch tuna down because that's where they're spawning so they've actually banned catching tuna, bluefin tuna down there but Mexico still gets the quota. So what they do is, is, is that Mexico talks to Canada and they trade it to the Department of Trade for pork bellies or lumber or wheat. And then they go like okay well what are we going to do with this quota? Well give it to DFO. And DFO goes, well, we're going to, well, that's worth money. We're going to sell it to all the fishermen. So they sell it to all the fishing associations through Atlantic Canada, and you get all this extra quota and extra pressure on the fish. And what's DFO, and there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're using that money to fund the acoustic sonar project in terms of a new stock assessment. So they're actually catching and supporting killing the last of what remains of the tuna to re research a project and their salaries and how to save the tuna. This is how crazy, this is where we reached right now. And I think, I believe those, that project DFL is doing is super important. I totally support it. But that money should not come from there. It should not come from selling tuna in Japan to support science in that way. That money should come from the federal government and give the Department of Fisheries the money they need so they don't have to, you know, put extra pressure on the stock. I mean, these are just the, these are just some of the things that you get. There's a number of things that you can do to to improve things, and that, that I think that would be a very important one. John Hopkins, writer and director of the internationally acclaimed documentary film Bluefin. Many of our shows have focused on the health of the oceans and their wildlife, including our own documentary film Salmon Wars. Alexandra Morton fights aquaculture on behalf of Pacific salmon. Daniel Polly explains why large predatory fish like the tuna have largely disappeared. And Alana Mitchell explores the general crisis of the global ocean. We're going to be doing more interviews about what's happening in the oceans, partly because we ourselves live on the ocean and care deeply about it, but also because the oceans cover two-thirds of the planet's surface, and what happens in the oceans shapes all of life on Earth. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Kemp.